Oof, for the introduction, Wes, I like it, uh, the uh, transport of audio over audio. <laughs> we had actually something like IP over audio in the very, very beginning, but uh, of course we want to talk about transporting audio over IP, so it's about the magic of flow configuration and packet setup. This is a bit more technical, in-depth to let you understand and learn how audio is actually transported, how the flows are configured, and how we can achieve the transport of MADI signals across IP with the same performance uh, and experience uh, you have with the traditional one-to-one -one MADI connections. So let's jump into the topic. Um, well, how does the traditional audio um, distribution look like? We have AS-EBU, AS-3 digital signals, not talking about analog signals, of course, we have still have that. We have MADI uh, on fiber or copper, and the way we are connecting this is called circuit switching, right? And circuit switching is basically this, in the old days at least, right? And uh, these days we used um, these devices replacing all the nice women at the switchboard and it's done uh, by some uh, magic electrons uh, making sure that the signals uh, reach their uh, destination. But we wanted to transit from this, from the digital audio distribution into, uh, sorry, into RJ45, into network, right? And that is what we call packet switching. What is packet switching? We all know what packet switching is. That's what DHL and uh, UPS and all these companies do day by day. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to networks, we have a slightly different uh, infrastructure. And of course, we are also using some nice electronic devices uh, for achieving this. So when we talk about packet switching, we need to understand what is a packet. A packet is a small segment of a larger message or data flow. And the data is sent over a computer network and that is separated into these uh, packets which resemble into a uh, flow and are received um, by a receiver and the receiver has the task to resemble this original data flow by receiving the packets. So packets, individual packets have a packet header and a payload area. So the packet header contains control information, such as routing information, addresses, sequence number, and other protocol-specific information. And of course, the payload section is what carries the related user data, in our case, the audio data. So, and uh, the way the packets are set up or built or assembled is usually defined by their protocol, which, uh, which what they are transported. IP, UDP, RTP are all different protocols and the packet app, uh, setup looks all different. So let's look into network transport and packet setup. And first, we need to understand that transport on networks is divided by layers or explained by using layers. It's the OC, uh, OSI or OC um, uh, network. Um, communication model, which is base, the basis for all network-based transport. So let's look in the uh, let's apply this OSI model to audio data transport. Right. So we have this seven layer of uh, defined by the OC, uh, all the way physical, all the way up to the application layer. And of course, on the receiving side, we have the very same layered mechanism, and we want to transport audio data, which runs on the application layer. So there's an application on one side, sitting on a device, transporting audio to a receiver on the other side. However, the data isn't actually transported that way. It has to pass to lower levels. And of course, the audio data has to be segmented into packets, into segments, because we don't have a constant flow as we have on a circuit switched traditional network, right? So what happens actually is that these audio data chunks are passed down the OSI stack into different layers and they get more and more and more header information depending on the protocol which is used on the individual layers. So we have the session layer, RTP protocol with the audio data, then one level down we have UDP transporting the RTP packets, then on the network layer we have the IP protocol transporting the UDP packets, the data link is working on the Ethernet layer, it's layer two, um, and then finally we have zeros and ones which are conveyed through the network either on copper, fiber, radio waves, whatever. And then these one and zeros are received by the receiving device and they are unwrapped and transported all the way up to the application layer again where we then can uh, receive and work with the data, the audio data which we have transported. So we want to pay a close look to how we configure our audio packets to finally be able to transport MADI over IP. So we are looking into RTP protocol and how that is assembled. 
Let's look at the RTP transport uh, protocol. The packet is uh, defined by an RFC, the RFC 3550, most famous uh, RFC for all of uh, our audio and video related stuff. Um, and that basically consists of the set RTP header and the payload area. So RTP has the control information in the header, it's 12 bytes, and the payload, that's where the audio or video or whatever data is actually uh, living. Now, let's take a quick detour, a very quick detour into a typical um, audio over IP solution layered approach. How is an AOIP uh, solution built? We have a number of functional blocks that's quite similar to the OSI model, but it's not directly related to it, like synchronization, media clocking, transport, QoS, and so on, all the way up to uh, connection management and discovery. And depending on the actual solution, it offers several options on these individual layers. As you can see, synchronization, for example, uses uh, IEEE 1588, that's PTP. Uh, transport protocol on the third layer is RTP over UDP, IP, and so on. And this is just an example of what Ravenna uses, so I don't want to go into all these different uh, layers because that's not the uh, topic for today. But we want to uh, check out what the encoding and the packet setup look like. That's the topic for today. So encoding of an audio signal, everyone knows that. I don't have to educate on that. And its sampling rate is one of the uh, parameters. Uh, we can usually have 48 kilohertz, but we can also have 44 or 196 or even higher uh, sampling rates, um, how we, where we, um, uh, how the audio data is sampled, actually. Then uh, the, the codec or the encoding is important. We are usually talking about PCM audio data, so that's linear. Uh, audio data, it's not compressed or encoded or whatever, so it's L16 or L24 linear data, so that's two or three bytes of audio data per sample. Now, and if we look at the uh, uh, originating sample stream, it's a linear or serial sample stream of sample one, two, three, and so on. That's what we get when we are sampling audio data. Um, and if we look at the byte stream, so uh, opening up the individual samples, when we use L24, we have three bytes of data per sample, and this is a serialized stream we receive from any input source. So how do we put this into an RTP packet? Right, here's the RTP packet again. We have the green area, which is the payload area. And so why not put the individual samples in the payload area? One sample per packet. Can we do this? Let's see if we can do this and if this is something we actually want to do. Right, so we have one sample of audio in the payload area. Now let's look at the layered packetization again. We have the layer two, it's the ethernet layer, which has an ethernet header, an ethernet trailer. Inside the ethernet payload area, there's the IP packet. The IP packet, again, has the header and an IP payload. In the IP payload lives the UDP packet, which has a header and a payload area. And inside the UDP payload, finally, there's our RTP packet with the header and the payload area. So we move the um, data into the, what happens here? Ah, okay. Well, that that's it. So now, if we look at this, uh, if you look at this assembly, we can see that there's a number, a quite fixed number of control data in front of the payload area, and then uh, four bytes trailing that. So that means that for every packet we are assembling, we have an RTP header of 12 bytes, and overall we have 40 bytes of fixed header information, which needs to be transported with any payload. So if we now put the three bytes, the one sample, the three bytes into the packet, well, we have three bytes of payload, but we have, uh, you know, 40 and plus the ethernet uh, number of bytes uh, of overhead with it. So, and so the, for, for, for three bytes to be transported, we need 61 or 65, if you use VLAN tagging on the ethernet layer, bytes as overhead. So the ratio is the net bandwidth efficiency is only 5%. So only 5% of the net bandwidth we have would be available for audio data. And uh, also on the drawback side is when we send out individual samples, we have a packet rate of 48,000 packets coming out of the transmitter, right? Because for every packet we are sending out, uh, for every sample we are sending out a packet. So that doesn't look very efficient, right? So can we stuff other things or more things into the RTP payload area? What about if we want to stuff, let's say, 48 samples times three, because every sa the sample is uh, three bytes into the payload area, so let's do this. 
Here are the 48 samples. So we have 144 bytes in the payload area now. And that already is an increase to 71% net bandwidth efficiency. So we have 71 of the bandwidth available for net audio data and the packet rate comes down to just 1000 packets per second. Well, because I'm waiting for 48 samples at 48 kilohertz, that's one millisecond. Each packet, uh, every millisecond, there's one packet. That's 1000 packets per second. That's way, way better and easier to deal with than 48,000 packets, right? So can we even increase the bandwidth uh, efficiency? But so what if we store 500 samples into the payload area? How about this? Let's look at this. So here are the 500 samples in the payload area. And we can see the, net, the, the bandwidth efficiency has increased even further and the packet rate goes down to just below 100 packets per second. Isn't that a good idea? Well, not quite, because we run into another constraint of the Ethernet protocol definition, and that is we are would now using more than 1,500 byte of Ethernet frame size. Some Ethernet supports the, the jumbo frames, but sticking to the standard means we have to obey the MTU, the maximum transmission unit, which allows us just to have 1,500 bytes in the Ethernet payload, which translates into uh, 1,460 bytes in the RTP payload. So that's the Ethernet payload, the red one, 1,500 bytes, the maximum we are allowed to use. And that comes down, subtracting the header information to 1,460 bytes of audio payload. That's a magic number everyone dealing with the protocols has in his mind. By the way, AES67 mentions 1,440 as the maximum allowed payload number. Any clue, any idea why? Well, we were looking at IP version 6. It's not part of the standard, but we thought if we limit it to what IP version 6 can transport in the future, right now we don't run into trouble when we transfer to IP version 6. So that's why AES67 mentions a maximum payload of 1,440 bytes, right? Um, so let's look at the table, um, just as an idea. Uh, we have um, uh, the same sample rate, 48 kilohertz, but we have a different number of samples stuffed into a packet. Uh, and you can see the packet rate, as in the beginning I mentioned, one sample per packet is 48,000 packets and a very low bandwidth, net effi uh, bandwidth efficiency. This is the uh, uh, resulting megabits per second for that particular stream. And the more samples, into an individual packet, the better is the network efficiency, the lower the packet rate and the lower uh, the uh, uh, bit rates uh, which we require per second. So wouldn't it be a good idea to um, stuff as much as possible into a packet, like 192 samples per stream or per channel? Wouldn't that be a good idea? Well, could be, but unfortunately, well, this is just a 96 kilohertz example, but unfortunately, there's the packet time. So the more I stuff into one packet, the longer I have to wait before that packet can be sent onto the network, but that directly translates to latency. If I want to st uh, uh, transport 192 samples in one packet, I have a four millisecond latency already on the transmitter side. So I can't beat this four millisecond latency, and of course there's additional latency uh, on the network transport. So what can I do about this? Well, how about not just using one flow, uh, one flow with one channel, but how about putting more channels into one flow? So that's how it would look like. We have uh, the example of one single channel in a, uh, in a stream. We have a nice sequence of packets. But if we add another channel to the very same flow, we have two channels in one packet. So packet sizes increase, packet frequency is being reduced. And the more channels we can put into one packet, the better it looks for the uh, efficiency and also uh, for the network rate. The packets grow in size, of course, because they have to transport more data, more channel data, but we get better network efficiencies. Let's look at the uh, particular application for this, just to get an idea. Easy surround setup. We have a 5.1 speaker setup. Um, we have a sender, which needs to send six audio channels to these six speakers. Uh, of course, there's the physical setup. Each device is individually connected to the switch. But logically, we want to transport six channels, right, over the network. We can do it with unicast, so make the sender sending out six individual streams with just one channel in it. That means that 
any of these streams has a fixed destination uh, with a, part a participating or related speaker, right? So six unicast channels. However, that is not very efficient as we have learned. We have six streams with just you know one channel in it. The alternative would be using multicast this time just one stream with six channels in it. So these, this multicast stream, a single stream, is received by all these six speakers, right? And we only had to tell the speakers which of the channels inside the stream it should play back, right? And then if we look at the table now, uh, here's the setup, 48 samples, right? One millisecond packet time. That's 1,000 packets per second, one channel per flow would result in a bandwidth of uh, 14 megabit per second. But if we use uh, eight channels per flow, we have an increase in the bandwidth uh, efficiency and we have a significant decrease of the required bandwidth, right? Each individual stream would use 1.8 megabit per second for eight streams that 14.5, but we can achieve the very same logical result transporting eight channels of audio with a multicast stream and that reduces the required bandwidth and increases the network efficiency. And here are the numbers for other packet times for let's say six samples per packet. You can see the difference is even more significant. Individual channels compared to a multicast channel. And if you go down to really very short packet time like one sample, um, that is a significant uh, difference right here, right? Eating up more than a quarter of the available bandwidth uh, on Ethernet if we use single channel transport versus an eight channel transport even at one um, sample per packet uh, is a significant reduction of the required bandwidth and the increase of bandwidth and, uh, efficiency. And now if we talk in MADI, 64 channels, we have um, similar numbers. If we, uh, I don't have compared uh, the um, the efficiency between uh, individual streams and 64 because that doesn't work out. But what I have done is look at the numbers uh, when I use 64 channels per audio streams with one sample in it compared to six samples per packet. So that is a significant uh, bandwidth uh, increase, uh, bandwidth efficiency increase. So looks like uh, it would be very efficient to transport the 64 MADI channel signal with a six sample per packet configuration. Right, um, if you're worried about all these numbers, there's an easy uh, Excel calculation sheet. It's available on the Ravenna website, basically, for free. So you can uh, enter all the numbers you need, uh, frames per packet, uh, channels per frame, is it L2, L, uh, is it L16, L24, what is the sample frequency? And it gives you a nice calculation how large the packets will grow for a particular packet configuration. You can see if it exceeds the 1,500 byte MTU or the 1,460 byte RDP load, it indicates this, okay, this is an invalid configuration, right? So um, don't want to go into the details. Also, there's much more calculations available there in terms of uh, what is the net bandwidth I require and how many of those streams can I put on the network before I reach the uh, bandwidth uh, limit of the available link. So all this can be done in Excel, so you don't need to learn about this. So what choices we do we actually have when it comes to specific protocols or standards? Let's look at AS67 first. AS67 is linear PCM encoding, 16, 24 bits. The number of channels per flow for AS67 is defined from one to eight per flow. So we can put one to eight channels in an individual flow. The packet time is mandatory, one millisecond, but Optional mentioned packet times in the standard 125 microseconds all the way up to four milliseconds. And the sample rate, 48 kilohertz, is the mandatory one, but it also has recommendations uh, to support 44.1 or 96, but they are not mandatory. Then 2110-30 is basically the same as uh, AS67, but not quite. Um, the linear encoding is the same. The number of channels per flow now can be one to eight or one to 64. How is that? I'll explain in a second. The packet time also, uh, one millisecond is included, but there's also a packet time of 125 microseconds, which is six samples per packet included. And the sample rate is 48 or 96 kilohertz. This is in the dash 30 standard, and this is all defined through what we call conformance levels. We have conformance level A, B, C, and the X variants. The X variants cover the 96 kilohertz. Uh, case, but A, B, C are the individual conformance levels defined in dash 30, and it's quite easy. 
A, level A, is what is the mandatory ingredients in the AS67. So conformance level A is absolutely identical to AS67 mandatory requirements. And then we have uh, level B, um, which is also covered by AS67, but just as optional uh, variants. And then level C is the one which defines 1 to 64 channels at a 6 sample per packet packetization. So that's the uh, stuff inside uh, dash 30. Well, MADI. MADI is strictly what the audio, related to the audio is L24, so it's three byte of audio, but there's more to it. MADI is based on AES3 audio. AES3 audio is more than just linear PCM data. Um, and uh, that means a, to, to transport a full MADI signal transparently, I would also have to cover the, uh, the sync and mode symbols as well as the AS3 subframe metadata, the PCUV bits. So AS67 doesn't cover this, but luckily enough, we have another standard for that, which is dash 31 in 2110. So 2110-31 21 covers transparent transport of AS3 audio. So it just simply does that by uh, adding an additional byte to the three-byte payload. So we now have a four-byte payload, which is used, the fourth byte is used for the PCUV and the, uh, sync, um, the sync information, so the block start and frame start uh, information. That's, that's how a MADI signal is basically put into a dash 31 format. By the way, the dash 31 format is uh, taken from Rowena's AMA24 format, so we had that uh, in place before, and Dash31 just takes up on it and says, okay, that's that's nice, we, we do it the same way. Uh, and then everything else in the definition doesn't basically change, so um, Dash31, to summarize that, is using the AMA24 encoding format, four bytes of payload, right? The number of channels per flow now is one to six, one to eight, or one to 60. I come to that in a second. The packet time is like dash 30, 125 microseconds, one millisecond, sample rate 84, 48, and 96 kilohertz. So what about this one to six and one to eight? Well, now if you keep in mind this math with the Excel sheet and how many bytes I am allowed to fit into a uh, payload area, maximum number, it turns out that with four byte of payload per channel, we only can stuff up to six channels into an 48, milli, 48 sample or one millisecond packet. And um, in level A, so level B is A channels again at 125 microseconds. But for level C, which can cover 64 channels in dash 30, we are again running into the limits so that we can only transport 60 channels on the level C per flow. All right, and then uh, to make it a complete picture, Ravenna has linear PCM or AS3 encoding. It also has other codecs uh, for other purposes defined. The number of channels per flow is basically completely free, um, as well as the packet time. So we are not limited in the combination of channels per flow and packet time, but of course, we have to obey the limit of the MTU again. So whatever combination uh, of packet time and number of channels per flow we chose, we always have to make sure we don't exceed the 1,460 bytes. And the Excel sheet, again, helps us to achieve this. And sample rate, anything uh, from 4401 uh, up to 192, in some cases even 384, is covered by Ravenna. Um, so, going back to the, to the vice versa view, if we want to transport MADI signals, um, how can we do this? Well, we can transport one flow with 64 channels, AS3 or AMA24, which is the full-blown MADI signal, right? We can transport this AS67? No. Why not? Because it's not covering four bytes of transport. It's just L24. So AS67 can't transport this. 2110-31? No. Why? Because we have the limit of 60 channels, right? As I explained earlier. Then Ravenna? Yes. Because with Ravenna, we are restricted to six samples per packet. We can go down to five samples per packet. And that opens some space to accommodate all the 64 channels in one flow. We can't do it with six samples per channel, but we can do it with five samples per, um, per uh, uh, flow. 
or per packet. And we can even go down to one. So some Ravenna implementations allow really fast packet transfer with just one sample, but 64 channels uh, in that flow. So what about the traditional, the first MADI, 56 channels? That was the original MADI definitions. And AS3, AS67 still out the game because it supports L24. Uh, dash 31, yes, with level C, we can transport 56 because the limit is 60 channels. Ravenna, yes, of course. Uh, and then we go down to PCM. Some, uh, in some cases, you don't need to actually transport the additional AS3 bits. You can uh, constrain yourself to L24 transport. Now, AS67 can't still do that uh, because there is nothing like 64 channels defined per flow in AS67. But Dash 30 can do this. Dash 30 can transport a 64 channel flow with just L24 payload and Ryan can do this as well. Um, and then if we go back to L24 with the 56 channels, we pretty much have the very same picture as with the 64 channels. So, we see AS67 appears to be out of the game for Marty. Right, I know that. Um, what can we do about this? We want to transport MADI with AES67, right? Well, luckily enough, we are able to transport multiple flows, like eight flows with eight channels, and the synchronization definitions in AX67 ensure that all these individual streams are precisely synced down to the sample so that a receiver can reassemble a 64 streams a 64 MADI stream or signal out of eight, eight channel streams. So that's how we can transport this with um, AS67, not with the full AS because that's not uh, covered, but we can do an L24 transport of the, you know, of the raw audio uh, signal with AS67 using eight flows uh, with eight channels. So to summarize this from the other side of things, AS67 can only work with eight flows, eight channels, one milliseconds. That's the only choice to transport a uh, MADI signal. It doesn't cover the extra bits. 2110-30, basically the same, no extra bits, but it can go uh, uh, all the way up to 64 channels using level C. So we can have one flow of uh, um, a MADI signal with all MADI signals in it. Dash 31 covers the AES transparent transport with the limitation that it can't transport one single flow with 64 channels, so we have to use the eight channel scheme again, eight flows, eight channels, with a full AS transport. Ravenna can do all of this basically, because we can reduce the packet time to, uh, to be in the limit of the MTU again, right? So we have the full option freedom with the Ravenna stuff. And uh, if you see all this variance you have with Ravenna, how do we deal with this in terms of interoperability? Quite easy, we have defined profiles for Ravenna. We have a generic profile, high performance profile, ultra high performance profile, AES67 is the one which lives in the generic profile area. 2110, both Dash 30 as well as Dash 31 are covered by the high performance profile definition of Ravenna. MADI actually lives inside this uh, high performance as well as the ultra high performance profile as we can transport MADI streams with one sample at a packet rate of 48,000 kilohertz. And that's the explanation how we can achieve full MADI-like performance even on an IP network. Just Put all your 64 channels in one stream, reduce the packet time to just one sample per packet with all the 64 channels. You have a high packet rate, but for a capable network, for capable sender and receiver implementation, that definitely is not anything it can't do. So that's the way how to transport MADI, the different options we have. Any questions? Okay, thank you, Andreas. Um, any questions, anybody? Okay, that's good. All right, thanks. So I can hey, catch you, up with you did a good time. job. There right. we go. We thanks. have more information. Just um, uh, uh, record well, record these uh, URLs. Uh, we have the Ravenna web page with a lot of resources, and also the Ames web page, which has a which has a very good resource uh, section. And that finally marks the end of my presentation. Thank you for staying with me. And uh, if you have any more questions, I'm on the side. Thank you.